Hello everybody and welcome to the second of the Infinite Fire webinar series. Um, last time I spoke about Heinrich Kunrat of Leipzig, the theosopher, alchemist, Kabbalist, Magus, um, who was born in 1560 and died in 1605. Today I'm speaking about someone, a slightly younger contemporary of his, um, Michael Meyer. Uh, Michael Meyer, like Kunrat, was born in Germany, this time in Rendsburg, um, in 1569. Um, like Kunrat, he spent time studying philosophy and medicine, whereas Kunrat studied in Leipzig and then graduated in Basel. Um, Michael Meyer studied in um, Rostock, Frankfurt and Padua. Then, like Kunrat, graduated as Doctor of Medicine in Basel. The difference is, Kunrat in 1588 was one of the um, sort of radical new followers of Paracelsus, who quite bravely promoted Paracelsian doctrines at his graduation. Maya, I have to say, was more conventional. He's much more, in his works, a follower of um, Aristotle and Galen, um, and more traditional, uh, more conservative medicine, really. At the same time, he does have good things to say about Paracelsus. He, he condemns him as being a, a rogue, really, and, and overly polemical, but praises the fact that his chemical medicines really do cure things that couldn't be cured by previous medicine. So he comes across as a sort of more of a moderate in, in many ways. What he's most famous for is his publications on alchemy, and also as being one of the main defenders or, or apologists for the Rosicrucians at the beginning of the whole publication of the Rosicrucian Manifestos. So, what else can I say about him? Um, yeah, he graduated in 1596 from Basel um, University as a Doctor of Medicine. Then he went to practice um, briefly um, uh, in various times and towns in Germany before spending time in 1608 arriving at the court of Rudolf II. There he did extremely well for himself. Uh, this picture shows that. This was engraved at, when he was 49 years age and it shows him as Imperial Count Palatine. He was um, appointed the physician, personal physician to Rudolf and did so well that in September 1609 he was elevated to the ranks of the nobility. Um, and uh, yes, here he is. He says actually that I have three titles from my schooling, presumably bachelor, master and doctor, and then three titles from the, C from, um, the, the emperor, from Caesar. And uh, yes, he's a knight, um, he's a count, and he's a member of the imperial consistory. So he did incredibly well for himself. I mean, alchemists sometimes do well. Uh, and uh, here, what's very interesting is if you look closely at this, and we'll give you a close-up of it, he actually petitions the emperor for a coat of arms that is alchemical. There's a letter that survives. He writes to the emperor and says, um, Avicenna, the Arab alchemist, um, ha writes about um, a pair of creatures, an eagle that flies above and symbolizes um, uh, Mercury, and um, a toad that is creeping along the ground. These two creatures are connected by a golden chain, and they symbolize the, the magistry of alchemy. And just to show you how interested he was, in one of um, Maya's publications, uh, this one here, fascinating publication, um, yeah, the symbol Areo Mensai Duo de Kim Nationum, the symbols of the Golden Table of Twelve Nations, which is basically um, a representation of one alchemical adept from 12 different countries um, who were invited to a banquet for the virgin alchemy. It begins with the oldest um, alchemist, as it were, the, the forefather of everyone, Hermes of Egypt, goes through Maria um, the Jewess and various other figures. We get to, there we are, Avicenna the Arab. So he's, Avicenna is the representative of the Arabic nation. Um, he's very well known as um, a writer of medical textbooks and, and alchemic ones too. And here we have the image of Avicenna standing there with the eagle and with the toad bound by the golden chain. And this is the image that Michael Meyer actually takes to represent himself on his coat of arms. Okay, after, um, yes, uh, he serves at the court of Rudolf. In the end, um, things aren't going very well for Rudolf, who gets deposed in 1612. In 1611, Michael Meyer goes off to England, and he spends time at the court of King James I, meeting uh, well-known people, possibly meeting Robert Flood, though we have no evidence for that. Though it is interesting to know that the person who is the engraver of these images in Michael Meyer's Atalanta Fugians, I'll discuss some of them today, um, Matthias Merian, 
is also um, the engraver of a well-known collection of alchemical engravings by uh, Lamsbrink on the philosoph Philosophical Stone. There's the title page and uh, beautiful engravings here. But he's also the engraver for Robert Flood's um, history of both microcosm and macrocosm. So there is some sort of connection there that Flood and Meyer both have the same engraver. Okay, going back to uh, Michael Meyer, he spends time in England. One of the things he's interested in is finding more about the English alchemical tradition. And in fact, um, he translates a text which some of you may know from the Teatrum Chemicum Britannicum. This is an English collection of um, alchemical poems um, edited by Elias Ashmole of the Ashmolean Museum uh, and published in London in 1652. I hope I'm remembering the date correctly. Um, it's, the title is Latin, but everything else is English. And in it, we find a very inspiring text, one that fascinated John Dee, about whom I'm speaking about next time, um, The Ordinal of Alchemy, of um, Thomas Norton of Bristol. This is a very interesting text for Meyer. Meyer actually goes so far as to translate it into German. Uh, the text is influential because it connects alchemy with the liberal arts. So, for example, with astronomy or astrology, with music, with mathematics, with geometry. And these are all themes that turn up in the Atalanta Fugians. To give you an example, uh, in, uh, yes, in Norton, we even have four astrological horoscopes. Uh, and it's interesting that Meyer practice is a form of alchemy which is aware at least of astrology. Sometimes it's only using it I think really as a metaphor, sometimes there's a suggestion that he really is paying attention to configurations in the heavens and the best time to do an alchemical experiment. Uh, maybe a little bit more about Norton later. But, back to Michael Meyer. Meyer in 1616 returns to Germany and he ends up um, no longer going to Prague. Uh, Rudolf has been deposed, uh, and uh, it's no longer such a great place uh, for, for the patronage of alchemy and, and magic and so forth. The best place for Meyer to go is in Germany, and he ends up at the court of Moritz of Hessen, uh, Hessen Castle, um, who is basically the foremost patron of alchemy in the German states. Uh, Moritz the Learned um, and his father before him were patrons of alchemists. If you go to Castle nowadays, the archives is incredible, full of a lot of material. Moritz ends up there as the, um, as the, as the chemist and the physician of Moritz. What some of you should know is that Moritz was also um, the, the, the lord of the city where the um, Rosicrucian manifestos get published. Um, we have... Um, here, the Fama Fraternitatis, published in 1614. We have the Confessio, published in 1615. And then, of course, we have the Chemical Wedding, published again, the Rosicrucian Chemical Wedding, published in 1616. These are all during the time when Meyer is still um, in England. And we do know that, actually, at first, he didn't pay much attention to the whole Rosicrucian um, uh, furore. Afterwards, though, when he gets to Germany, especially when he's spending time in the court of Moritz, he becomes extremely fascinated by the whole um, Rosicrucian uh, enthusiasm and uh, becomes basically one of the main people who's trying to communicate, contact the Rosicrucians, and in the end becomes a major apologist for them, defending them against uh, cr criticizers who, who are putting down the whole movement. Um, anyway, he spends time at the court of, of Moritz and publishes in the years 1616, 1617 and, and onwards an incredible number of books, one of them being the Atalanta Fugians. Uh, one thing I should point out is that uh, Moritz also is famous as the um, patron of the first ever professor of chemical medicine um, at the University of Marburg. Uh, Johannes Hartmann was appointed professor there in 1609 and he stands as the first professor, the first person recognized as a teacher officially of uh, alchemy or chemistry uh, at a university. And again, it's Moritz who's uh, funding that and supporting it. Um, some of you, I'm sure, will know also one significant thing about the lens of Moritz. Castle being the place, really, um, the location of the Rosicrucian publications. Um, the first one of these was published in 1614 in, and where is it? There we are. Uh, it was published in 1614. 
the Fama Fraternitatis. Um, the next, the Confessio was published in, here we are, there's the Confessio as well, published in 1615. And then the Chemical Wedding, uh, the famous allegory um, of Christian Rosenkreutz going on a journey um, and, and with many alchemical consequences to it, was published in 1616. Now these, uh, this publication endeavour started when Meyer was still in England at the court of James I. And we know that at first um, he didn't really pay that much attention to, to the Rosicrucian story. But when he gets back to Germany and ends up at the court of Moritz the Learned, his fascination begins to develop. And in fact, Meyer becomes one of the main apologists for um, the Rosicrucian uh, ideals uh, and, and publishes various works. For example, Silentium Post Clamores, a work called Silence After the Clamour, after the hubbub of the initial publications, gets published in 1617. And this was sort of one of these wonderful years for Meyer, in that even though we know he was physically ill, his literary output was incredible. One of the um, publications being this, Atalanta Fugiens, which is, uh, here we are, 16, well, 1617 was the first edition, this is 1618, uh, the next edition, uh, about which I will be focusing on today. Although I'm not going to be talking about all of these today, otherwise we'll be here forever, mm -hmm. I'm going to pub pub mention one or two of his publications. This is, um, yes, the Arcana Arcanissima. It's one of the first major publications. Um, yes, the secret, the most secret of secrets. Um, uh, it's Meyer's um, interpretation, his alchemical, or chemical if you prefer, interpretation of ancient mythology. Uh, here, Egyptian and Greek mythology. Uh, and Meyer also later on goes into interpret Roman uh, mythology as well. And actually he's become really the main figurehead for what you'd call mytho-alchemy. If you think that there's gold-making alchemy, um, the sort of practical laboratory alchemy, then you've got chemical medicine. And there are other times, there are sort of more literary types, and mytho-alchemy is one of them. Um, last week I talked about Kunrat. He's a laboratory alchemist, but also described as a theo-alchemist. Um, this is an interesting text because actually a manuscript survives in, I think, Leipzig from memory, um, where he calls it um, a manuscript on the theos theosophy of the Egyptians. Um, he's fascinated by hieroglyphs, and he knows a hieroglyph means sacred writing, and that theosophy is, of course, divine wisdom. And his belief is that if you read myths, Literally, you would be absolutely appalled by what's going on because it's often stories of incest and rape and so forth. And he said, this can't be the real meaning. You know, if it were, what, who on earth would want to read myth? Instead, you look for the secrets. And he says they are encoded alchemical secrets. Some of that we're going to be looking at today. Anyway, the Archon Archonissima is actually where he sort of sketches out some things he develops later. Other things which um, are worth it, very much worth looking at is, for example, this uh, smaller text. Again, beautiful title page. This one, um, the seven planetary deities, who are also, of course, seven metals. Um, that's, that's how it is so much often, so often in alchemy. And here it's, uh, yes, his viatorium, that is um, his sort of uh, travel guide to the uh, seven mountains, or to the mountains of the seven planets, or the seven metals. Um, a very worthwhile a good text to read. And what else? Ah, yeah, this one.
In fact, he translates it into German and uh, into, uh, you yeah, know, into Latin, sorry, and um, it appears um, without Kunrat's name, uh, published in the Deutsches Theatrum Chemicum. Um, so thank you, Michael Meyer, for promulgating Kunrat, even if you don't put Kunrat's name on it. Other texts which are worthwhile looking at with Michael Meyer in relation to Atalanta Fugiens are things like this. Okay, uh, reading upside down again. De circulo physico quadrato. So on the physical circle squared, um, by which he means gold. Uh, and this is a very sort of geometrical analysis of, of gold. He's using geometry as a metaphor again for ideas about alchemy. This is a motif that turns up again in Atalanta Fugiens, and I'll show you one very famous image which is all about that. Um, other things which I have to say are almost cute about Michael Meyer, he seems to have been an ornithologist. He's fascinated by birds. Um, he, he's, uh, Harry Wood Tilton has written a book about um, Michael Meyer's quest for the phoenix, which symbolises the highest things in alchemy for him. Here we have the phoenix acting as a judge in, um, yes, a, a nasty argument between all of the birds who are accusing the poor owl. Here is the owl, the, the, the bird of Pallas Athena, the goddess of wisdom, and they're all ganging up on the owl. And uh, apart from the hawk, who acts, there we are, the hawk, acts as her a sort of defender, and the phoenix as the judge. And so you get the raven, for example, kicking off the, the squabble, the court case against uh, the owl, and then the nightingale and various other birds. In the end, the owl is vindicated. But what I'd like to point out is Maya has a singular fascination with birds. I mean, they're part of his alchemical bestiary. They always are. I mean, birds are always in alchemy. Uh, winged birds, which symbolise the volatile spirits uh, ascending in the alchemical flask, or if you prefer the spiritual uh, interpretation of alchemy, the spiritual soul ascending towards the divine, and wingless birds being the fixed, those either earthy beings or, or sediments in the flask. Uh, but anyway, Michael, uh, Michael Meyer has more of an interest than most in, in, in alchemical birds. So welcome then, finally, uh, to the Atalanta Fugiens. This is the focus for today. It's a beautiful work. As I said, the engraving is by Matthias Marian. Marian. Um, uh, the design, though, by Michael Meyer. Um, and yes, it's the Atalanta Fugiens, Fleeing Atlanta, uh, a Greek myth that you find in Ovid and, and various other sources. And basically, this is a collection of 50 alchemical engravings. Um, each of the engravings is, uh, in, is um, complemented by a piece of music, a three voice fugue. And, and this is a, a play, really, Atalanta Fugiens, um, Fleeing Atlanta is a play on the word fugue. She's fugitive. And, and so are the fugues. Um, and uh, it's, it's described as an emblem book. Okay, here's the full title in English. Atalanta Fleeing. That is, New Chemical Emblems Concerning the Secrets of Nature, adapted partly for the eyes and intellect in figures engraved on copper, with mottos, epigrams, and notes attached, partly for the ears and for the soul's recreation with some 50 musical fugues in three voices, of which two are set to a simple melody suitable for singing in couplets, to be looked at, read, meditated on, understood, weighed, sung and listened to, not without a certain pleasure. Mm. Okay, um, of course, a certain pleasure for what kind of audience? Uh, immediately, I'd have to say an audience which has actually been as well educated as Michael Meyer at various universities. It assumes that you have a knowledge of theology, that you have a knowledge of mythology, um, that you have a knowledge of astronomy, geometry, music, arithmetic, and I hope at least some knowledge also of chemistry. And I should point out here, he's actually quite sort of adamant that it's chemical not alchemical. In fact, he has a sort of reluctance to actually describe anything he does as alchemical. So we're getting into that sort of 17th century period of, is it alchemy or chemistry? They are usually interchangeable as terms, but he, he's, he certainly has a preference for chemical. Whereas Kunrat, in his work in the Amphitheatrum, still has alchemy there, but he also has physical chemistry. So be aware of that if you're interested in the history of alchemy. This, though, is undoubtedly mytho-alchemy. Yeah, we find, um, uh, for example, on the title page, let's look at it. Yeah, 
if you were to ask anyone who knows mythology, uh, especially Greek mythology, for myths that have something to do with um, gold and alchemy, then these are very good places to begin. At the very top of the page, we have the Garden of the Hesperides. Now, this is the garden of Jupiter's wife Hera. It's in the west. Um, the garden is often linked with Venus, with um, the, the evening star. Um, Vesper, for example. And here we have got the three um, daughters of Hesperus, uh, the Hesperides. We've got Aigle, we've got Arethusa, and here we've got Hesperusa. They're three charming young ladies who are there guarding uh, the trees. Um, sometimes it's one tree, sometimes it's many trees, uh, which have golden apples. Anyone who eats a golden apple gains immortality. Um, because the gods don't just trust three charming young women, they also have, um, yes, a, uh, a monster there. Um, in, in some stories it's a hundred-headed dragon um, called Ladon. Uh, here, uh, I don't think actually Marianne could cope with a hundred heads, but it's certainly a, a multi-headed multi dragon there guarding the garden. Who have we got here? We've got Hercules um, with his, um, yes, uh, wearing the Nemean lion's skin on his back. Um, I'm sure you know all about the, the labours of Hercules. Um, you, maybe you don't remember, but the eleventh labour of Hercules was that he had to steal apples, the golden apples, from the Garden of Hesperides. So that's why he's here now. Um, you might know the story that actually what he does is he tricks Atlas, who's busy holding up the heavens, and says, if I hold up the heavens for you, will you go and get some of the golden apples from the garden? Atlas is actually allowed to do that because... Well, he's either the father or more often the uncle of the three women in the garden. So Atlas goes and gets the golden apples, doesn't actually want to take back um, carrying the heavens on his shoulders, but he's tricked by Hercules, um, takes the heavens again, Hercules gets the golden apples and goes off, and there is the eleventh labour done. So here we have Hercules, and it's interesting in one of these engravings, Hercules is for Michael Meyer, one of the um, I have to say the archetypes of the alchemist or the chemist. Hercules or Ulysses or Jason, for example, with the golden fleece, um, they, they all represent the alchemist. So here we have the alchemist. On the other side, we have, um, yes, we have Venus labelled here, or Aphrodite if you prefer, but here we've got the Latin Venus, and uh, we have um, Hippomenes. Now then, you might know another story to do with golden apples, the famous one where Paris... Um, son of the, the King of Troy, has the uh, uh, sort of, well, unenviable task of choosing who is the most beautiful between three goddesses, Hera and Pallas, Athena and Aphrodite. And uh, being a young man, he chooses the most beautiful for him, who is Venus. Um, anyway, that's another of the stories that, again, the alchemists know about. This one is one that Michael Meyer is particularly interested in. It's the Prince Hippomenes. He's in love with a young woman, Atalanta. The only problem with Atalanta is that um, she insists that she will only marry the person who will beat her in a foot race. Atalanta is incredibly fleet of foot. Um, if you don't beat her in a foot race, a foot race you get killed. So the poor Hippomenes, who is lovesick, calls um, a Venus, who says, basically, take three golden apples. And when you're running around, um, uh, drop an apple every so often when uh, Atalanta seems like she's going to overtake you. Atalanta will stoop, pick up an apple, and you will run for your life <laughs> so that you, you win the race. Um, he drops his three golden apples, one after the other. Here at the bottom of the page, we have Hippomenes running... Uh, like Fury, he's dropped one apple, Atalanta stooped to pick it up. Uh, anyway, Atalanta wins, he, he's lost his golden apples, but he certainly hasn't lost his life. Instead, he's won um, the, the uh, devotion of Atalanta. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. The two of them make out, basically, in a temple. And the temple is of the goddess Cybele, who is not very thrilled at the fact that these two young people are sort of, uh, yes... Uh, consummating their nuptials in her tentle, temple. So what does she do? She turns them both to lions, and here we have two lions. Again, if you're interested at all in the history of alchemy, you know that lions are one of the animals in the alchemical bestiary, um, usually a, a winged lioness and an, a wingless lion, uh, again for volatile and fixed aspects of the, uh, the alchemical work. It's very interesting that, yes, these two figures have been turned into lions, 
And also, if you know your history of art, you know that the chariot of Cybele is in fact pulled by two lions. So, there is a very quick introduction to the title page of the Atalanta Fugiens. As I said, there are 50 engravings in this um, book. I'm not going to talk about all the 50, all 50 of them because you'll probably get bored to tears, but I'm going to go through a few. Um, I'm going to begin with the first one, partly because it's also one of my favourite. Um, if you're wondering who the first source is that Maya um, uses uh, in, for his inspiration for this text, um, it's, um, surprise, surprise, it's Hermes Trismegistus, the author of the Emerald Tablet. Um, I've already mentioned the Emerald Tablet in the um, webinar about Heinrich Kunrat, but for those of you who are watching for the first time, it's the, um, uh, the very short text which basically begins with, as above, so below. That which is above is like that which is below, and that which is below is like that which is above. There's another very famous line in there which says, Its father is the sun, its mother the moon, the wind carries it in its belly, its nurse is the earth. Okay, and there are so many different interpretations of that. On one level, um, its father is the sun, is literally fire. Um, the mother of the moon is water. Um, the wind, of course, is air. And the earth is earth. So you've got the four elements. Here we have, um, yes, an emblem. And I want to say just a tiny bit before I begin in, on the detail of the image, talking about what emblem books are. Okay, um, so if we look, emblems usually are... Um, basically, what can you say? They're images, they're texts which are there to entertain people, yeah? Educate to a certain extent, but they're for an, a learned audience who basically see a text like this. At the top, it has a motto or an inscription, which gets your mind working. Uh, then it has a picture which develops the motto. Sometimes there's a tension there between them so that you have to figure out what the link is. Sometimes it utterly complements the motto. And then below that, you have a subscription, or here, entitled as an epigram, a short poem. So, a three-part, tripartite structure. Now, this um, is something that became very popular in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries. The person who kicked it off is, um, yes, Andrea Altiati, um, or Altiato, um, who developed this from... Um, uh, humanistic studies where he realized that people were very interested in uh, mythology and uh, yes he develops this whole series of engravings where you've got for example here uh, again the uh, inscription image and subscription tying in with this which is nothing to do with alchemy but is a, an intellectual game as it were uh, is also was also hieroglyphic literature um, the hieroglyphics of Horopolo were discovered in the 15th century, in the early decades of the 15th century. These claimed to be Greek interpretations of Egyptian hieroglyphs. Uh, the truth be told, they weren't, but they kicked off a whole craze of Egyptian hieroglyphs. Um, this is from mid-16th century. Um, but again, what you see is basically... Title and image and text underneath explaining what's going on. Um, originally, these actually only began with the uh, text. There was no image. But it became um, so interesting to people that, um, for example, Albrecht Dürer was commissioned to interpret the text and actually draw images which were presented to the Emperor Maximilian um, in the, the early 16th century as a gift. Um, uh, Michel Nostradamus, so someone you may also have heard of in esotericism, Not Nostradamus was so fascinated by them that he translated these hieroglyphics into French verse so that um, readers could uh, see them there. Why I am mentioning them now is that Michael Meyer undoubtedly draws some inspiration from the, hi the um, hieroglyphics as well. Here is an image, for example, um, representing impossibility. It's a body walking without a head, or it's, um, uh, here we have feet with no body. And it, it represents, you know, things which are impossible. One of the emblems in Michael Meyer, if I can find it, is um, a figure standing outside a rose garden, trying to get into the rose garden, but the figure has no feet, and again, it represents impossibility. And I am looking for it here for you. Uh, you might need to sort of cut this off, I'm afraid. I should have done this before and I forgot to do it. 
Ay, ay, ay. I know it very well, but I can't find it in your book. Do, 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 do. Come on. This is doing things in a rush. There we are. So, to show you, here we have an epigram. Uh, we have, uh, sorry, um, from Atalanta Fugians, we have the image of a man there standing there without feet. Again, representing impossibility, trying to get into the rose garden of the philosophers. Those of you uh, who know about the history of alchemy will know that the Rosary of the Philosophers, the Rosarium Philosophorum, published in 1550, is actually most likely the source that Michael Meyer is using for his idea of motto, image, and um, an epigram, because in 1550 the Rosarium was presented in that way. Carl Jung, of course, is famous for, for taking that sequence of images and giving them a psychological interpretation. Uh, Michael Meyer isn't trying to be psychological about it, he's interested in alchemical interpretation um, and refers to the Rosarium quite frequently in these texts as one of his favourite sources. Here we actually though have literally a rose garden of the philosophers. Here we have the, the Greek pantheon of gods that also represent metals um, lurking outside and we have this poor alchemist, clearly a rather misguided um, f figure, uh, without feet, no basis on which to enter the garden. He has neither the lock nor the key. Uh, well, the lock's there, but he hasn't got the key to get in the gardens. So we have this sort of combination of emblem and um, hieroglyph there as, as structures for the text. Okay, returning to... Returning to the first image. So, if you look closely at it, it's, this, the image is, is entitled... The wind bore it in its belly, so it's from the Emerald Tablet. And if you look carefully, you have this uh, very dramatic figure of um, a male figure uh, with, uh, yes, a very windy hair coming out of his head. It represents Boreas, the north wind. And uh, if you look extremely carefully, you'll see that there is an embryo in the wind's belly. Michael Meyer has, okay, his musical tune, he, which um, uh, accompanies this, three voices. One, the first voice is Atalanta, you could say, as it were, the soprano voice. Um, and then the tenor voice, we have Hippomenes, the prince. And then at the very bottom, the sort of cantus firmus, um, we have um, the apple, the golden apple. And uh, you always have these three voices, Atalanta, Hippomenes, and the apple. They don't always have the same position actually, um, but they are the constant throughout. For example, here's another engraving, and again it has, well, Atalanta, Appalant Hippomenes and the apple. Other ones you'll find it's different. Maya gives you this, he gives you um, his image, he gives you his epigram, and then he gives you a couple of pages of explanation of what's going on. Uh, this is not so standard in early emblem books, but it becomes much more the case later. And the format is that basically he first of all begins with a general context of, um, for example, Boreas. Who is Boreas? Boreas is the god of the winds. He has two sons, one with red hair, one with white hair, which immediately, for any alchemist, will mean, ah, okay, the red substance and the white substance. Red substance is sulfur, white substance is quicksilver. Um, and, but then, after giving you a sort of general idea of the myth, he goes into more alchemical details. And it's very interesting what he says. Um, if we uh, go back to the story of Atalanta and Hippomenes, we're told Atalanta represents Quicksilver. She's the one who's running fast, and Hippomenes is trying to stop her or slow her down. So Atalanta, the female figure, is Quicksilver, and Hippomenes is Sulphur that's fixing her. Yeah. And um, in alchemy, certainly in medieval and early modern alchemy, the two major ingredients of the Philosopher's Stone are quicksilver and, and sulphur. People who are interested in Paracelsus will immediately say, well, where is salt? Because Paracelsus in introduces a third principle which really fixes them. Fiery sulphur, fixative salt, and quicksilver mercury. Actually, Michael Meyer is not Paracelsian. Um, so you don't find that. I mean, you can argue, perhaps, that the apple is the thing that really fixes Atalanta. She stops dead to pick up the, quicks to pick up the golden apple. So perhaps it's there 
tacitly, but actually he, he never really gives any Paracelsian third principle. All the way through the book, it's mercury and sulphur. The, the animals that you meet, mercury and sulphur. And they, they all represent that in different manifestations. In um, the first engraving here, the um, north wind is, there we are, the north wind represents quicksilver. It's quite unusual because it's a male instead of a female. Uh, and um, Michael Meyer says it's argent vive, which is usually French for quicksilver. And, and it's, that's interesting because one of the major sources he cites as an authority for this is Ramon Lull. Um, it's not the real Ramon Lull, it's what historians of alchemy call pseudo Lull. But it's interesting that whoever produced these medieval texts uh, attributed to Ramon Lull uses a lot of the same ideas as Lull in the way they communicate ideas about alchemy. And what I find very curious is that actually Ramon Lull's style of communication is sort of the opposite of Michael Meyer. Michael Meyer uses pictures and poetry. Ramon Lull or pseudo Lullian texts use, use wheels which you revolve and, and letters. It's, in, it's extremely abstract and sort of mechanical in its way of communicating the ideas. And Michael Meyer is really the opposite. But he's locating himself quite firmly in the pseudo Lullian tradition. Um, and, and, and yes, Argent Vive, I should say, in the pseudo Lullian tradition is very interesting because it's the, it's the matter, it's the primal matter from which God creates everything, God creates the universe. So here we have, yeah, Argent Vive there as the primal matter bearing the little seed, the fiery sulphur, in his belly. And, and this is what gets um, explained in these two pages. Um, we also find other significant sources. I've mentioned Hermes at the very beginning. The first word mentioned is Hermes. I've mentioned Lull. Um, I've, we should also mention actually George Ripley. 15th century, um, I, I, in many ways, yes, you could say the most important alchemist in England. Uh, Jenny Rampling at the University of Cambridge would undoubtedly agree with that, as she's a specialist in George Ripley. And uh, I hope one day she's going to give one of these webinars. But um, yeah, here we have um, Ripley cited as another source for this combination of mercury and sulphur. And uh, another text actually that Ripley is indebted to, the Scala Philosophorum, the, the ladder of the philosophers. Uh, but also the fact is that George Ripley is the most famous representative of English alchemy. Um, he travelled, uh, in uh, supposedly he travelled to Italy, so he had influence on the continent. Um, if you're interested, Jenny Rampling at the University of Cambridge can talk until the cows come home about George Ripley. Uh, and I hope she does one of these webinars. Um, another person she could give you more information about is the, well, not the person, but the text, is the Scala Philosophorum. Um, the, the Ladder of the Philosophers, a work that she has identified as being extremely influential on George Ripley. Both of them are cited here um, by Michael Meyer. Um, there are some other, other things I should mention about this text, which I have to say puzzle me, but I find absolutely fascinating. In explaining the picture, uh, he says, OK, on a physical level, this represents here the wind carrying a fetus in its belly. So it symbolizes the gesta gestation of the philosopher's stone using the organic metaphor of conception uh, and gestation and birth. This is something that you find from very early on in the history of alchemy. Um, the Liber Trium Verborum, the book of three words uh, attributed to Khalid ibn Yazid, um, equates the development of the Philosopher's Stone with the development of the human fetus. So Michael Myers using that, don't forget he's a physician, he's a doctor, he, and many of his audience who maybe don't know their alchemy will know their medicine. So he begins with that. Then it gets uh, puzzling. And I have to say, I sometimes begin to feel very unqualified. I haven't had the same rigorous education as a 17th century um, scholar would have had. He says, Okay, physically, it's the fetus that will soon come into the light of day, will soon be born. Arithmetically, yeah, it's the root of the cube. So, for example, um, yeah, if you have a, a cube, a number of eight, then the root is two. You know, two twos are four, two fours are eight. Um, so it's the root of the cube. He's given you a geometrical, sorry, an arithmetical idea about it, uh, uh, how to sort of conceptualize it. Um, musically, then, he says, okay, if you think that the quadrivium 
uh, the, the four mathematical sciences taught at university uh, were, um, okay, arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy. He works his way through these. He says, arithmetically, it's the root of the cube. Musically, it's the, I'm reading upside down, um, it's the distiapason, um, which is the double octave. And, and here, okay, he only gives you hints about that. Um, but don't forget, you know, music is important there. It's implicit in the whole text of the Atalanta Fugians. Um, elsewhere, he develops this in various texts. For example, in his text I've mentioned on geometry, on the squared circle, um, and also uh, in, in various others, he, he links um, music, for example, the text I've not mentioned so far, which is the uh, Cantilenae Intellectuales, sort of intellectual songs uh, on the phoenix. Uh, he returns to this sort of three-voice structure that he has here later on in, I think, 1622, um, around then anyway, just around his death. Um, here, though, he's just intimating. So, musically, it's the double octave. Uh, moving on from there, we get geometrically... Um, yeah, it's a point, it's a flowing point on a line, yeah. Actually, uh, if I look at the Latin, a generative point of a flowing line. Uh, this might not mean a lot, but if you go and read Boethius, uh, his Institutions of Arithmetic, it will all become clear to you. Um, if you have, um, yes, a line, and you have a point, and the point sort of moves along the line, it generates a line. Uh, the point moves and this line becomes larger, bigger, that one becomes smaller on the line. Um, so he's, he's intimating that this, this point, the fetus or the sulphur, is like uh, the fiery point uh, at the beginning of the whole um, generation of the cosmos geometrically, from a point to a line to a surface to a solid and so forth. Um, so we've gone through arithmetic, we've gone through music, we've gone through geometry, then we get to astronomy. And I have to say, this is something that puzzles me. I don't know enough about astronomy. He says, astronomically speaking, it's the centre of Saturn, Jupiter and Mars. Um, now then, this is slightly puzzling, because one thing is, does, what's his model of the cosmos? Is it Ptolemaic cosmos, where the Earth is at the centre, or is it the Copernican cosmos? You know, Copernicus in 1543 publishes about the fact that the Earth is heliocentric, not geocentric. Michael Meyer, um, according to Harrywood Tilton, anyway, is um, his, his an image in one of his books. Uh, yes, if I show you there. In the Septimana Philosophica, the, the sort of uh, philosophical week, again connecting each day with um, different metals and processes. He has an image of the cosmos, uh, and um, Tilton says that actually... Michael Meyer is neither geocentric nor heliocentric. In some ways, he's like Tycho Brahe or Tycho Brahe, um, who was at the court of Rudolf at the same time as Meyer, um, in that he has a sort of compromised system. Um, Tilton says it's actually based on um, someone called Rultmann, who was at the court of Moritz the Learned, in fact was the uh, mathematicus, um, the, the astronomer and mathematician, for Moritz's father, um, Willem. And uh, so it's interesting uh, knowing that he has this sort of hybrid system. It doesn't really help me, though, with my interpretation of, you know, the, uh, the fetus in the wind's belly is the centre of Saturn, Jupiter and Mars. Now, um, does that mean that the very centre is the sun? Or does it mean the very centre is the Earth? Or, or uh, for those of us like me, rather dumb, the middle of Saturn, Jupiter and Mars would surely be Jupiter, <laughs> if it's the middle between Saturn and Mars. But anyway, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to take you quickly, um, reluctantly quickly, I'd love to go through them slowly, um, through various other engravings in the book. In this first emblem, though, he set it up. Some of these engravings focus exclusively on the geometry of an image. Other ones focus on the bestiary, as I mentioned, the lions and dragons and serpents and so forth. Other ones are mythological. So he's appealing to different types of audience. But underneath it all is always the alchemy or the chemistry uh, and the secrets of nature. Uh, and um, also the music, which carries the audience on. Since I've introduced in the first emblem associations with geometry, I thought it would be interesting to show you uh, well, uh, emblem 21. This is um, a very popular um, uh, phrase uh, which you find, for example, in the Rosary of the Philosophers. And the, um, 
Yes, the uh, text at the top says, Make a circle out of a man and a woman. Derive from it a square, and from the square a triangle. Make a squ circle again, and you will have the philosopher's stone. So, you've got a sequence of geometrical images. You've got a square, you've got a triangle, you've got a circle, you've got the male and the female. Uh, always with man and woman in, in alchemy, you're talking about mercury and sulphur. If you remember Atalanta, it's usually the woman who's the one running away, and it's the man who's in pursuit. Um, here we've got the male and female there. And uh, this fits into a sort of fairly standard idea of conceiving things, uh, conceptualizing things on a geometrical level. Circle is, as the most simple of, um, uh, of uh, images, represents simplicity uh, and also on that level puri purity. So on one level it's um, the, f the primal matter of alchemy, but it's also the ultimate matter, the ultima materia, which is the philosopher's stone. If any time you're talking about a square, you're talking about a four-sided um, structure, and that's the four elements of air, fire, and water. Um, when you're talking about a triangle, uh, and Maya explains this uh, dutifully um, in his discursus, um, it's body, spirit, and soul. Um, so, so there really, in, in, sort of in a nutshell, you've got the idea of primal matter, um, the four elements and the, the, the uh, what can you say, the, the underlying structures of elements, the, the, the solidity of substances, the body of them, but then also the spirit and soul. Of course, Maya, as pretty much every alchemist, certainly those who are theosophical alchemists, has in the back of his mind also the body, spirit and soul of man, or of mankind, I should say, men and women. So there, it's, it, maybe you could argue it's implicit there. There are people who read Maya as, as advocating a form of spiritual alchemy, or at least a parallel to his laboratory alchemy. I have to say, though, reading the text, though, do bear in mind, these are always about the secrets of nature, and most of the material in there can be read on a laboratory level of matter and what he's doing with matter. Um, looking through to give you a little bit more information about this, um, in his discursus, in the explanation, he also says that there are four elemental colours. So when you see the square, think of colour as well. Um, the triangle represents body, spirit and soul, um, but what you have is the body or earth is the blackness of Saturn. So there's the, the nigredo, the first stage of the alchemical process. The spirit is the lunar whiteness as water, and the soul uh, or the air is solar yellowness. So you're getting a colour sequence. You're getting body, earth, blackness, or body, blackness, spirit, whiteness, and soul, yellowness. And then the circle itself represents the redness of perfection. The Philosopher's Stone is always red in its final stage. So a sequence progression from black, white, yellow to red. And uh, Again, you know, you do find coloured versions of this. One of the most beautiful is at the Getty. There's a manuscript there, 17th century French translation, where you've got the images brought in. So you've got the sort of audio of the music, but the visual there, and ways, that, suggestions that people can actually visualise on the page in colour as well. In an incredible uh, production in the 17th century there. Michael Meyer returns to geometry later on. If we look at emblem 39, um, you uh, might recognise what's happening here. Uh, if you know the, the famous riddle that the Sphinx asked Oedipus and Oedipus had to, to solve, what goes on four legs in the morning, two in the afternoon and three in the evening? And usually the solution to that is it's a baby, then an adult man, and then an old man with a walking stick. Michael Meyer says, yes, that's what they say, but actually it's nothing to do with that. Alchemically, it's something totally different. The four in the morning, you can guess, it's the four elements. And then he said the two, if you look very carefully at this engraving, you can see, um, yeah, on the forehead of this person, you've got actually what looks like a semis semicircle or a sort of a moon, not quite a crescent moon, but a half moon. Uh, here you've got, um, yes, on the old man, a triangle. What he says is, yeah, the four, there's the baby, is the four elements. 
the, uh, the two is actually the half moon, which is the white color of the stone uh, when it's in a sort of immature form. And then the old is uh, the triangle, which again is the body, spirit and soul. So he's taking the geometries again, but he's doing something different with it. He's sort of explaining the geometry of alchemy now through a Greek myth. So appealing to a slightly different member of the audience. So here we have an example of Michael Meyer taking a text that many of his audience probably are aware of, the Riddle of Oedipus, but doing something new with it to, to stimulate them. Uh, and, and he says, yes, this interpretation of the, the ages of man is mistaken. Instead, um, yes, we have this tying in with an ancient myth with, Greek, with, with alchemy. And as a sort of support for this, he mentions uh, an Arabic um, alchemist, Razi's, and says that Razi's in his epistle says, the stone is a triangle in essence and a quadrangle in quality. So again, we have the geometry of the triangle in essence here, the quadrangle there, reinforcing our alchemical ideas. One of the things I've mentioned with Michael Meyer is that he has an alchemical bestiary. Um, he, he works through various kinds of creatures. We have terrestrial creatures, we have um, sort of subterranean ones, reptiles and so forth, and we also have birds, his, his uh, ornithology, as it were, his ornithological alchemy. Here is a very nice example, MM16. Um, we've already mentioned the two lions um, uh, that Atalanta and Hippomenes become after they've been in the uh, Temple of Cybele. Well, here are two lions again. And as I mentioned, we've got the uh, lioness as a winged lion, a volatile substance that flies into the air, and we have the male fixed lion. Uh, and this is what Michael Meyer explains, actually, in... Uh, in the text. We have other creatures, we have a salamander there for example, the, the creature that can live in fire um, as, a, as a representative of, of substances that can survive fire, and we have other lions which turn up uh, in the text. Here for example is a lovely image of the green lion, um, the blessed greenness that um, the Rosary of the Philosophers praises uh, in uh, the alchemical um, pursuit. So you've got many creatures. Um, you've got lions, you've got um, salamanders. One of the most famous images um, nowadays, I have to say, is image 24, which is of the wolf. Okay. If any of you have read the works of Laurence Principe, and I hope you have done, um, then you'll find that he uh, has cracked basically one of the, the, the 12 keys of Basil Valentine, uh, which is a text, don't forget, that Michael Meyer um, translates and publishes with, with beautiful new engravings. And um, Principe has, has shown people that um, the wolf here that is devouring the king actually is a symbol of the, the mineral antimony, which is used as a way of um, separating gold from the dross of, of uh, whatever it's mixed up with. And here we have a, a, a sort of ferocious wolf there literally devouring the king. So we have got lions which represent what different aspects of, of the alchemical process. We have a wolf there that represents the, the mineral antimony. Uh, we have a salamander which represents the substance that is fixed uh, in the fire and survives the heat of the fire. What I'm going to go on to next is um, some of the reptiles, which um, uh, I, I particularly find fascinating. You've got the dragons, you've got lions uh, uh, and serpents and so forth, but also to point out that the very final engraving in this series, engraving 50, in includes a dragon in it. So it's something that I think is worthwhile looking at. Okay, one figure that I've not given enough attention to on the title page is the dragon. If you think in the history, uh, in, in, in mythology, you've usually got dragons connected with gold. You've got, uh, with the golden fleece, um, Jason has to battle a fiery dragon. You have the dragon here gu guarding the golden apples. And of course, in alchemy, you have dragons. You have the Ouroboric dragon swallowing its own tail. Here we have a symbol of that. And Michael Meyer is always extremely clear. The dragon or the serpent, in fact, a dragon is a serpent that has eaten another serpent, it becomes a dragon. Um, it's always Mercury. Yeah. Um, that's what, for Michael Meyer, it, it always symbolizes. Um, so here, for example, we have a dragon swallowing its own tail, which means it's digesting its own poison. Um, here we have um, a, an image 
of another dragon being bludgeoned by the sun and the moon, which says that the dragon doesn't die except with its brother and sister. Here the dragon again is representing Mercury. The brother and sister, the, the sun and the moon there, actually represent extracted sulphur. So again you've got the two main uh, ingredients of the Philosopher's Stone in one image. But they're all sort of, well, destroying each other in a way, but it's all part of the alchemical process. This is particularly dramatic when we get to the final engraving of the Atalanta Fugiens, where we have, there we are, yes, a dragon entwined around a woman in a grave. And Michael Meyer again emphasizes that the dragon here is a subterranean creature, um, uh, and it represents Mercury again. And here what it represents is the dragon represents the fiery and the earthy elements, uh, whereas the woman represents the watery and the airy elements of, 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 of substances. In fact, what he says is that the dragon is the dragon. The woman, actually, the alternative name for her is the eagle. And sometimes you get people like Kunrath who talk about the fiery dragon and the, the watery eagle, or the white eagle, the red dragon and the white eagle. So here we have, in this rather macabre-looking image, we have a combination of substances which represents the sort of combat of the four elements, um, but united in, in one deadly embrace, but an embrace that is the necessary conjunction of the Philosopher's Stone. And it's quite curious. I find it really fascinating that this is the final image in the text. It's the Philosopher's Stone, but in a, in a sort of bizarre, sort of almost gothic way, um, you, you have this, this sort of deadly embrace. The Ritman Library is very fortunate to possess a, a 17th century painting of some of the images from the Atalanta Fugians. One of them has the first image and the last image. It has the image of Boreas as the north wind, um, i.e. As, as Mercury, with sulphur in its belly. Here we have the, um, the serpent, or dragon, again as Mercury, looking, I have to say, as though it's trying to be a python and swallowing this poor woman and taking her into his belly in a slightly different way. Um, so you've got sort of mirroring going on. And what I find interesting in the Rittman painting that they've got is that actually um, you'd expect it to begin, you know, reading from... Um, here to here, you'd expect Hermes to be here, sorry, the, uh, the emerald tablet first image to be here, and the serpent devouring the woman to be on this side. In fact, it's the other way around. It's reversed. It's as though this is a circular process, that you can begin again here and return there. Uh, as though, again, like the serpent swallowing its tail, the alchemy is a process that you repeat again and again, like repeated distillations or sublimations of things and distillations again. Very interesting indeed. Um, looking at another of the images that the Ritman has, here we've got two other of the images. Um, this one is all about rejuvenation. It's an old man in um, a glass house, Glass house symbolizing the alchemical vessel on one level, eating apples, um, not golden apples here, but lovely lush red apples, but thinking of the apples of the Hesperides on the uh, title page of the book, these rejuvenate him. This is a very interesting image uh, in the uh, book. Um, one of the sources that are uh, uh, inspiration for Michael Meyer is actually Marsilio Ficino, the Renaissance Platonist, who writes um, uh, in his book... Um, three books on life. He writes about um, melancholy and how to cope with that on an astral magical level. So using astral image energies uh, in talismans and in, in foods that re relate to um, the different planets. Maya seems to be implying that something similar can be going on with the alchemical process. Um, after all, uh, he's making alchemical medicine Michael, uh, and, and so is Marsilio Ficino. They both talk about potable gold, for example, that the alchemists make to cure things. So that's a very interesting image. This one, I have to say, is one of my favorite. It's a symbol of nature guiding the alchemist. And there you have the, the, the alchemist who, actually this one, um, yes, it seems a slightly younger alchemist. He's not wearing glasses. Um, whereas in, in Michael Meyer's original engraving, he's got his spectacles, which he needs to see clearly. He's got his lamp to lighten the way. He's got his staff to make sure that he doesn't, um, you know, misplace his steps. And nature is guiding him. He's following nature's footsteps. Meyer has um, a very nice sort of um, 
concordance between the actual image and the sort of things that you, you need to be aware of um, in the, uh, the study of, of, of any sort of applied art, whether you're a physician or whether you're an alchemist. For example, you have to have reason and experience assisting you. Uh, and this is implied here with, with the lamp and with the staff and so forth. So it's a very nice image and also to a certain extent a sign of humility. You're following nature. Uh, if you think of Francis Bacon um, in the 17th century writing about the relation with nature, you have man raping nature, exploiting nature. This is a very different mindset. It's, it's nature is there as the guide and you are following and presumably, yes, in a respectful approach. So, uh, looking, at, we've looked at some of the engravings of Michael Meyer. There are many I've not discussed. I've not discussed the birds. I've not discussed the images of hermaphrodites. Uh, I've not discussed images, for example, of Saturn vomiting up the stone uh, from mythology, um, which in theory Kronos had swallowed his son Jupiter, uh, and the alchemical interpretations to do with all of these things. Um, but what I would like to say, one question is, okay, what kind of alchemy are we talking about? Um, is Michael Meyer propounding a form of spiritual alchemy here? We know that he becomes um, a supporter of the Rosicrucian ideals. Uh, we know that the Rosicrucians are not uh, particularly into gold making. Uh, in fact, the, the manifestos, the Rosicrucian manifestos, condemn gold making. At the same time, um, Paracelsus is praised by them as someone who knows what he's doing with chemical medicine. Michael Meyer is into chemical medicine. People have argued for a sort of spiritual dimension to Michael Meyer, and I think there, there is some justice to that. There's at least a sort of parallel processing going on where he's seeing alchemy as a mirror to his own life. Um, like uh, Ficino, he seems to have suffered from melancholy, and whereas Ficino sees astral magic as a way of coping with his melancholy, uh, Michael Meyer sees some of the, um, the, the purification, uh, the, the sublimation of the, the gross human being to, to more refined moral and spiritual states as perhaps mirrored in his alchemy. At the same time, it's resoundingly a laboratory alchemy. This is a book written by someone who works in the laboratory. He's a chemist. Um, he's a physician for both an emperor and, and a landgrave, Moritz, in, in Kassel. Um, and, and he makes that clear in some of his interpretations. For example, one of these is he talks about the mountains. And, and, you know, on one level you can think, oh, the mountain is the ascent of the soul to the divine. But he says the mountain actually should be read as the uh, laboratory equipment. It, when we talk about the snow in the mountains or the clouds in the mountains, that's the alembic on the top of the alchemical kukurbit, um, the glass vessels on the furnace. And when we talk about the whiteness ascending up there, it is... The clouds, it's, it's things being sublimated or evaporated in the Alembic. And he's really explicit about that. So um, if you bear in mind that he says these are chemical emblems of nature, you cannot sort of uh, ignore the fact that there's a, a sort of natural element to this. And he actually, again, explicitly says, this is natural, it's not supernatural. So even though later people have taken Maya and done other readings with it, which is perfectly legitimate as far as I'm concerned, Maya himself here is ultimately being very natural in what he's, he's discussing and what he's propounding. Okay, so there is a quick whirlwind tour of a few images from Michael Meyer's Atalanta Fugiens. So much more could be said. Um, we're going to be providing um, a reading list for anyone who's interested. I haven't talked about uh, the music. Um, if anyone is interested, please go and check out an article which you've, of mine which you can find online called Laboratorium Auditorium Oratorium. There I discuss various um, types of alchemical music. Um, uh, Heinrich Kunrat, some of his uh, songs, alchemical songs, but particularly Michael Meyer and one or two examples of uh, how the music has developed in his fugues. Um, there are also recordings you can find of performances of the music, some beautiful ones, so I hope you enjoy those. Okay, that's Michael Meyer, um, the end of the, the second webinar. The following one will be um, on John Dee, on his Monas Hieroglyphica, and generally John Dee's worldview. And I hope you um, enjoy it. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh...